Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Sam. And I've been a grateful member of Al-Anon since November of 1994. And I'd like to thank... I'd like to thank Bob for asking me to speak and Dave for being a really great host. Um, congratulations to the Roundup for keeping it going for all these years. Um, that's, that's really great. I used to be involved in a Roundup where I live in Iowa, the Mellon City Roundup. Um, <clears throat> and as a member of Al-Anon, uh, there were some jobs that I, I was allowed to have, and the job I was allowed to have was hospitality chair. And, you know, and so I know a lot of people put a lot of work into this Roundup before people even thought about coming. So really, can we just give them <clears throat> and being a hospitality chair at a conference really tested my Al-Anon skills because it was my job to make the coffee. And I remember one year we had Clancy speaking as our main speaker, and I made the coffee, and I'm, you know, it's 7.45, 15 minutes before the meeting, and alcoholics are coming into the hospitality room, and they don't have the coffee cups here. They've got, they had bigger coffee cups, and they've got these big, huge mugs, and they're all draining that big coffee pot, and I'm watching the line go down. And, you know, in, by that time in Al-Anon, I had been relieved of the obsession of how much an alcoholic drank. But I want you to know that that obsession came back um, very quickly as a, as, I, as a hospitality chair doing coffee. So um, I think the coffee people here are doing a great job, and, um, and it's, it's great to see. And um, <clears throat> I uh, grew up in what I like to say is just a pretty normal alcoholic home. Uh, my father drank uh, my mother was mad, and my brother and I basically spent most of our time hiding from what was going on. Uh, not really anything exceptional. My earliest memories of family dinners are uh, of um, my father and us all joining dinner together uh, awake, but by the end of dinner, my father would be passed out in his chair with his chin in his chest. But the thing that was interesting about us as a family was that my mother and my brother and I went on with dinner and talking as if nothing had happened. Um, and most of the time, we just left my father passed out in his chair uh, and turned off all the lights and went to bed. And, and we took that on the road. We took that to family dinners um, with other people, and, and my father passed out at family dinners. And I remember just always being so embarrassed, so, you know, so mortified that this happened. Uh, but at the same time, I could never talk about what was going on. I could never tell anybody how I felt about what was going on. Um, <clears throat> My, uh, and my earliest memories are just wanting my father to stop drinking and, and wondering why he drank so much. Uh, you know, my father is an Episcopal uh, minister, and we would, we would attend the church where he presided at, and, you know, and I, we would go, with the, we would be there, and I knew there would be a fight on the way home because, you know, there, I, would, I, I would go up to communion, and I would, you, would, you would barely have to tip the chalice to drink any wine that was in the chalice that my father prepared uh, back at the altar. And sure enough, after the communion was over, my father would go back behind the altar and he would drain the rest of the chalice and my mother would shake her head, you know, and say that she had told him that he should pour that out. And, and there would be a fight, and there would be a fight on the way home. And, um, and you know, that, that was just kind of what life was like, you know, growing up. It was just everything seemed... In my mind, everything seemed to revolve around my father's drinking and whether my father was drinking or not. And eventually what happened was my father got sober. There, there one day there was an intervention. Uh, a couple of his colleagues came to the house, and my brother and I were sent to play video games at the mall. And the result of that intervention was that he entered a treatment program uh, in 1984. And he went to the Hinamaka Treatment Center in Kaneohe, Hawaii, where we lived. And from entering that treatment center to this day, my father has never had another drink. Um, and so I want to say thank you to Alcoholics Anonymous for my father's sobriety and for his miracle. Um, but I want you to know that my life did not change when my father got sober. I went into high school, and I just did the things that, that regular teenagers do. And, um, <clears throat> and I, you know, just to kind of give a good example was that, uh, you know, I always felt, I, I identify with what alcoholics talk about, not feeling enough always feeling like I need more, uh, self-centered fear, you know, and I knew in ninth grade there was a solution for me, and her name was Carrie, 
And she did not know that she was my solution, but I knew that she was. And, and Carrie didn't know that I existed or anything like that. And, and most of the time, I, I just love to feel sorry for myself that Carrie never knew me. I would stay at home in my bed, and I would play uh, Phil Collins against all odds, the 45 on my record player, um, and just imagine, you know, if she knew me, you know, the tragedy of all of this. Uh, this is how I just spent Saturday afternoons. And, and I even, you know, occasionally my family and I would drive by where she lived to go uh, to a beach. And I, I remember putting that, uh, we had a Walkman for people, some of you young people don't know, we didn't, we had tapes, cassette tapes. I put that song on a cassette tape and I queued it up so I could play it when we drove past her house. I mean, I just loved, I just loved to feel sorry for myself just from the very early stage. And I loved the drama of my, the, you know, that just very quiet drama of my own life. And if you had come to me and said and, that, you know, you grew up in an alcoholic home and you need Alateen, you need, you need some help, I would have told you that, no, alcoholism is over. My father stopped drinking. And, you know, my problem is, the, you know, my friends at school that don't pay attention to me. My problem is Carrie, who, you know, who doesn't know that I exist. Um, <clears throat> I had no capacity to admit that I, that I had been affected by alcoholism. And, you know, growing up in Hawaii, uh, I essentially thought, well, okay, life isn't going well for me here, so I'm going to move as far away to college as I can where no one goes. And so I moved to Illinois. I went to University of Illinois. And, and you know, for a while, everything was great because I'm the guy from Hawaii, and, uh, and no one else was from Hawaii, and everybody treated me special. You know, and for a while, I felt even, and I felt, you know, and I felt like I was a part of. But as time goes on, I just become one of the bunch. And, and, I, and if I'm just treated average, you know, and I think I heard Clancy once say this at a, at a convention where he said, it, it, he said to, he said, if you, all I ask of you is if you, if you are close to me, is to treat me special all of the time. And he said, if you treat me special, I feel average. If you treat me average, I feel rejected. And that was the story of my life, was that after a while, people start treating me in an average way, and then my ego gets in the way, and now these people don't like me. And so my solution, again, is to move even farther away. And I decided that, well, um, I'm a Russian major. I'm going to go live in Russia. And so I just made the decision. I'm going to go study abroad and go live in Russia. And I did. I picked up, and I lived there for a year. Um, I met another solution there. Uh, her name was Katie. And um, Katie, I don't know if Katie really liked me very much, but she seemed to like me more and more every time I bought her lacquered barrettes. And so I just basically got into a habit of, uh, you know, going up and down this, these streets of St. Petersburg and finding jewelry to buy for her, and she seemed to like me better. And, you know, then that's a pretty good relationship for me. And it came time for me to come back to the United States, and I decided, no, I'm, I have to make this relationship work. So I decide to move back to Russia and find a place to live, and I get a job as a guard at the American consulate in St. Petersburg. Um, <clears throat> and I'm no, I'm no bigger then than as I am now. And so as a guard, I, I was not that, um, uh, you know, I was not that scary. It was my job to use a mirror on a stick to check the uh, consul general's car for uh, explosives. I walked. Through, I was trained in how to do that. I, I can train you on how to do that if you need to know how to do that. Um, it was my job to translate for the Russian police outside. I knew the language very well. I found myself in strange situations. I found myself one day being the target of a Soviet protest. I'm standing outside the consulate like I normally do, and there's protesters walking down the street with hammer and sickle flags, and I realized they're, they're coming for me. Um, you know, and I've listened to alcoholics talk about how they took a drink, they got drunk, and they, they lived in Iowa, and they ended up in Tijuana. And I'm here to tell you, as an Al-Anon member, no alcohol was necessary for me. All I had to do was think, and I ended up somewhere. Because, again, I spent my whole life listening to what my head told me to do. And if I had a feeling, I acted on it. If I had a thought, I acted on it. Um, and I found myself in these situations, and I wondered, and I often wondered, well, how, did, how did I get here? Well, one day, um, you know, that, that girlfriend had moved back to the United States, and, and I was still working as a guard there. And, and, and essentially, one day, what happened was it was about time for my, uh, uh, about a few days, I was supposed to return um, to go back to college. And, and I'm sitting at a desk in the front of the consulate, and I put my hand uh, in a drawer to get something, and I feel something just poke my hand, and I take my hand out, and I think, well, what was that? That was weird. Uh, you know, two days go by, my finger starts to swell up, and it's got, it's very puffy, and it's got this white dot on the top. And I had a friend who, I had a Russian friend who was a doctor, and she said, well, 
you, 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 have to, you have to drain that. So she said to get some needles and some hydrogen peroxide, and I started going, and I had this swollen finger, and I started stabbing at it um, in order to drain what was ever in there. The day after that, it starts erupting black blood, and I've got this crust on my finger um, of black blood that keeps oozing out, and it's time for me to fly back all the way from St. Petersburg, Russia, all the way back to, um, to Chicago. And by this time, I cannot move my finger at all. You know, I get on the plane, I get to, I get to Europe, and they pull, me, they pull me aside in the airport, and there's a nurse who won't come any closer to me than, than Dave is over there looking at my finger and asking me if I'm okay, do I need some medical attention? And I say, I'm fine, you know, I'm fine. And I get on the plane, I get back, you know, on the plane to New York, and I'm getting off the plane, I hit my hand on something and it just bursts, and blood starts rolling all the way down my hand. And, and they, these Port Authority police officers rush me away, they put this bullet compressed bandage on my hand, and they whisk me to this medical center, and they bring me in, and they say to the, they say to the nurse, they say, this guy just got back from the Soviet Union, and his finger's falling off. And I said to them, you know, in a really bad state, it's not the Soviet Union anymore, it's Russia. Because I'm more concerned that we get everything geopolitically correct, the fact that I, you know, I could be, I might be losing my finger. Um, and that's the way my life has always been. I've always sort of been distracted by these minutia I'll pay attention to while there's actually something I should attend to over here. And essentially what happened, what I found out what happened to me is I'd probably been bitten by a brown recluse spider um, when I was in that consulate. And that I was, uh, I was extremely lucky to only to not have lost my finger, um, much less anything else happened to me. Um, you know, and it took, it, took, uh, it took months for that, it took a long time for that finger to heal. And, and I was back in Illinois, and, you know, I had a huge bandage on my hand, and I needed a roommate for my last semester in college, and a friend of mine found me a roommate, and, you know, imagine this. I found a roommate who, uh, who drank too much, and um, <clears throat> don't know how we got put together. And essentially what happened was, you know, he, he would get drunk and throw up and rip the phone out of the wall and then deny that he had done it. And there were only two people living in this place. And... Um, <clears throat> Had something happened to me in the sense of, you know, I, I, I lay awake at, at bed, in bed at night, you know, in fear of what I would find in the morning, in fear of what he would do. And all of a sudden, it just took me back to being eight years old again. You know, and I'm eight years old, and, um, and I'm afraid of what my father and my mother are fighting about, or what my father's going to come home drunk. And, um, and I did something I had never done before. I actually called my parents, and I asked for help. I told my father what was happening. I told my father that I was you know, that I was living with someone who drank and I was scared and, and he suggested that I go to an Al-Anon meeting. And, and I, to this day, I think of all the things that could have sent me to an Al-Anon meeting. That was not one of, there were other things that happened to me. But I, but I went. I went to an Al, I went to my very first Al-Anon meeting in the basement of the Unitarian Universalist Church in Urbana, Illinois. And, and I was, and I was terrified. I don't know why I was terrified, uh, but I, I remember walking up to that door and I had no idea what I would find at the other end, at the, on the other side of that door. Um, what I found was actually the AA meeting. I opened up the door, and there were all these people in leather, and uh, there were bikers. And I remembered enough from my father's AA meetings that, that this was probably AA. This was probably not Al-Anon. And sure enough, I said, you know, where's the Al-Anon meeting? And they pointed, they pointed to, like, this little room, and they said, it's in there. You know, and so, and, to, and I have to say that, that served me, you know, for many years, I've been to many places, gone to many Al-Anon meetings, and I've known, I have, a, I have the knack for picking out the smallest room in the basement of a church or school, and that's where you find the Al-Anons, um, you know, huddled, huddled over the daily readers. They're, you know, the AA's got the big gym or something like that. Um, <clears throat> you know, so I opened up that room, and there was a kitchen, and there were, you know, and, and that's where the and I sat down. I don't remember what anybody said, but I remember that when I talked about what was happening, people nodded their heads. And usually people shook their heads when I talked. <clears throat> and after the meeting, I got up, and people were all around me. I couldn't get away. Someone gave me a meeting list. Someone gave me, some, gave me a newcomer's packet. They told me to keep coming back. And that's what I did, is I kept going back to that meeting once a week. And, and I felt good when I went to that meeting. And then the week would go on, and I would, you know, I, would, I would obsess about my roommate's drinking. I would feel bad. You know, and I'd go to that one meeting, and I would feel better. And eventually, my father asked me, you know, he would say to me, do you have a sponsor? And what I thought, I knew my father had a sponsor when he was in AA. Now, I never asked what a sponsor was. I assumed a sponsor was the person who paid for his treatment. 
you know, like a, like a race car driver. You, race car drivers have sponsors. Alcoholics have sponsors. You know, the sponsor got him through treatment. And so I didn't think I needed a sponsor. Um, <clears throat> and essentially what happened was I read the newcomer's packet, and I interpreted the newcomer's packet to say, if there's an alcoholic in your life, you throw them out. Um, <clears throat> and so I started self-sponsoring. And I decided, I told that roommate, you know, that we should not be roommates anymore. And so we sublet that apartment to two drug dealers who, <laughs> who never paid the rent. And I have to say that really, you know, um, you know being an Al-Anon and when I did my inventory and, and to this day, that the problems in my life have never been the problems in my life. The problems in my life have been the solutions that I have come up with when I think I am dealing with problems in my life. Um, <clears throat> and it was then that I got a sponsor. I was motivated to get some help. And I went to a meeting. I went to a, another meeting, and there was a man in the meeting who, you know, he laughed. Uh, he was active. He, when he spoke, I could tell that he had been in the program for a while, that he was living this program. And I went up to him, and I asked him to be my sponsor. And he said he would be my sponsor if I would do what he asked me to do. And what the first thing he asked me to do was call him every day for three weeks. And I'm really grateful that I didn't say, well, you know, I don't think I want to call you every day for three weeks. Um, I did. I called him every day for three weeks, and the thing about that is, the end, after the end of three weeks, I knew how to. I knew his phone number by heart. Uh, calling him was an easy. It became it became a very easy thing to do to call my sponsor. He also said to me that we're going to work the twelve steps in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm very glad that I didn't know enough to say that uh, I'm not going to do that because that's not conference approved literature. And so my sponsor, he gave me assignments. He gave me reading assignments. He gave me step assignments. I was to have my assignments done when we met. Um, I started going to more than one meeting a week, and I started to become more than just an attender of Al-Anon, and I started to become a member. Um, and he had me read the big book, and he said, you know, and my father had me, when I was new, I tried to read the big book on my own, and, and I just couldn't, I couldn't get into it for some reason. But when my sponsor said, my sponsor said, when you read this book, I want you to substitute the word thinking for drinking um, <clears throat> and, and alcoholism for alcohol. And when I read the book through that lens, the book described me. Um, I could see my own. I could see my own behaviors. I could see my own um, that line and how it how it works, where it says, "Is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well?" And I could look back through my life, and my life had always been a case of different episodes of me trying to get all people to fit the roles I wanted them to fit. Um, <clears throat> and I learned about the disease of alcoholism. And I've never, and I, if you are a new Al-Anon member, or if you're, even if you're not a new Al-Anon member, one of the things I can't recommend more is to attend open meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I went to an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous um, <clears throat> uh, with with my sponsor, and it, and I've learned I, there's a we have a lot of great literature in Al-Anon about alcoholism. We definitely do, but I've learned so much <clears throat> about alcoholism from at AA meetings, from AA speakers, um, because. And, and I could, and learning from you, I could apply that. I could see that in my father. You know, I learned, I learned that I thought my father chose to drink. I thought my father chose to be an alcoholic. But when I read the doctor's opinion and the description of alcoholism, that my father had, that my father had a physical allergy to alcohol coupled with a mental obsession, that he couldn't, that he had a mind that essentially told him that one drink would make everything better, but a body would not, but a body that would not let him stop at one drink. That was not me. That was not our family. I could see that my father had an illness. My father had an illness like diabetes, like cancer, and I started to develop that compassion. And and we started to work the steps. And we just and I and I hope I wish for you what I had was that I got active and involved in in the Alamon family groups. I went to area assemblies all around Illinois, um, and you know my sponsor and I were one of the only men. We would go and they would do raffles, and I remember I won. I want a chrysanthemum, right? I mean, you know, most some, most Al-Anon members know what to do with a chrysanthemum. You know, I took my chrysanthemum home and it died somewhere. I'm sorry to report. You know, in one year they rigged the raffle. They had like a tool set and a flashlight, and they read our names. You know, so that we you know we won something that you know I would know what to do with, I guess. And um, you know, and to this day I hear people sometimes say, "Oh, I don't want to go to assembly." But you know, when I came into Al-Anon, I had I had no friends. You know, my life was I had my life basically fit in like a small box. You know, and the only people that loved me were people in these rooms. And when I went to assemblies, people were happy to see me, 
and they welcomed me, and I was eager to drive to Edwardsville, to Marion, to Carbondale, you know, wherever we could go, because I knew that these were people that, that loved me and that would care about me, and um, <clears throat> and and I really re- I can't I can't uh, I can't recommend that enough. And um, we started to work the steps, and 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 I remember when it came time to do the inventory, you know. Um, I think it was I think it was Joe that was talking about doing the inventory, the four column method in the big book, and and and, and I did that too, and and it, and you know, and on that list, on the very top of the list was my father. You know, I resented my father because he, you know, because he drank too much, because of what he did to my mother, because you know he was not at ever he was not at my soccer games, you know, he was like one name, and then there was like a full page of resentments, you know, and I I remember I wrote that I wrote that resentment list, I wrote you know the other people, you know the girlfriend who didn't like me, even though for all the barrettes I bought her. And, you know, all those people were on the list. And I remember I took the train from Champaign, Illinois, to Carbondale to go do my fifth step with my sponsor. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and I started to read my inventory. And and, you know, and, we, and I thought I was just going to read it, but we read it. And he stopped. And, I, you know, he, after I read the resentments about my father, and he, um, and he said, you know, you, he said, you know, you may not have had the father that you wanted, but you definitely had the father that you needed. And, you know, and I had grown up, I, I went to private school. Um, I never went without food or shelter. Um, I was never abused. And I went to meetings, my friends in my meetings, I went to meetings with people who, when their alcoholic parents came home, they had to run for safety. And when my sponsor said that to me, I could finally see that, you know, that that resentment, that, that my father loved me and that my father was the victim, that my father had an illness. Um, and that I could begin to forgive my father and love my father, and I could feel that resentment just start to peel away. And that was what we did with those resentments, is that when I read them, we just, you know, and it didn't matter if it started with me or it started with the other person. And to this day, it doesn't matter if it starts with me or the other person, but it has to end with me. Um, because if it doesn't, then I'm, then you're the problem, and you have to change for me to feel better. And so we went through those, you know, we went through those resentments, you know, you know, well, you may be buying the first barrette was not your problem, but buying the 10th barrette, hoping for a result you never got, might have been your problem. You know, we went through all of those resentments, and, and I could see, you know, like Joe said, you know, that, um, that even if I didn't start it, I perpetuated it, and I had a part in all of those things. You know, it was a good thing we started with the resentment list, because by the time I got to the sex inventory, um, you know, my sponsor was pretty, I looked up, I was reading the sex inventory, and my sponsor fell asleep. He was asleep. And, um, <clears throat> and I wasn't sure if I should feel comforted or not. I thought, well, I thought it was better than this. Um, you know, but there was something strangely comforting that my sponsor fell asleep. And, and I remember my sponsor said to me, you know, he said, you know, there's nothing that you haven't done um, that, that I haven't either done myself or at least gave my serious consideration. And, and after that, and after that fifth step, when, I, when, you know, when we were finished for that night, I had had a feeling of peace that I had never had in my entire life. And, and I, I grew up in a religious home, my father being a minister. I've been blessed by the Archbishop of Canterbury, but I never wanted anything to do with religion. Um, with, with I associated religion with what was happening at my church, you know, my father being back there and what was going on in my home. I couldn't reconcile myself to that. And, um, <clears throat> you know, that feeling only lasted like an hour, but it was real. Um, and the big book, I believe that that was one of the promises in the fifth step, that it said that I would have that feeling. And I started to see the big book as more, I started to see things that it said would come true, come true in my life as I took those actions. And we continued to read the big book, and it was as simple as if we saw a prayer, we prayed it, and if we saw an action, we took it. And to this day, when I sponsor people, that's what we do. We read the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and when there's a prayer, we pray it, and when there's an action, we take it. And I know today that my role as a sponsor is that I'm not anybody's solution, and that their, their job is not, I'm not to give them my higher power, but it's essentially my, my job as a sponsor is to help them take the actions that, so that they find their own higher power and that they find their own solution. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and I, I did that fifth step, and, you know, and I, I had a list of defects, and I had a list of assets, and, and I remember I worked at a bookstore at the, at the time, and I went back to this bookstore, and we decided that we would have a rock band in the bookstore. I don't know why we'd have a rock band in the bookstore. The rock band is playing in the bookstore. We've got earplugs in so we can talk to the customers. And the, the lead singer comes over to us and says, hey, are we too loud? And I say, no, no, not at all. 
And, uh, and I just said, I just lied. That was a lie. <laughs> and, and that's really what, you know, the fifth and sixth step did for me was that now I had, when I, saw, when I, when I, when I, when I, when I engaged in that behavior, I had a label for it. I saw, I saw myself in action. And to think of all those years prior to Al-Anon where I did all of these things and I was completely blind to it. Um, <clears throat> and my sponsor said to me, he said, step six, <clears throat> step six is a process. He said, just kind of wait. You know, and that was what happened is I saw my defects in action. You know, and I saw, you know, I saw the pain they caused. And that was how I became, would become entirely willing. Um, eventually, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Around that time, um, I, uh, I decided to go back to school. And I moved, I moved to Lafayette, Indiana. And, um, <clears throat> And that move didn't go well for me because, you know, where I, where I went to Al-Anon, Al-Anon was, um, you know, I thought that we did it right there. And, and it was different where I moved to, and, and I had a huge resentment. And I would chair meetings, and I would tell people, you know, when I chaired meetings, we're going to do things differently tonight. Like, here's what we're going to do during the meeting. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I have a bad cold. I'm trying to get over <coughs> And um, no one changed, um, and my resentment remained. And, you know, slowly, and not overnight, but slowly I started to, you know, get back into the, you know, into sponsoring myself. I had a sponsor, and my sponsor would give me suggestions, and I would take some suggestions that made sense to me, and I would not take others. And eventually what happened was, is, you know, I, be, I became a victim again. I became a victim, and I was a victim uh you know, of, you know, people in Al-Anon are not doing it my way. And, and the only thing that really saved me in that time was that I found someone who was sicker than me. I found someone to sponsor. Uh, and, and I sponsored this person for my whole time when I lived there, and it probably saved my life. And I don't know why it worked. This person was an eye surgeon, this per and I was a graduate student. This person's tax bill was bigger than my entire income. But, you know, we, but we, what did we do? We got together, we read the big book, and when there was a prayer, we prayed it, and when there was an action, we took it. Um, you know, and I still did those things. And, um, but, I also, but also, success started to become important to me, and I started to become competitive. I had won an award for some of my work in graduate school. Um, and I remember receiving this award at a big, you know, at a big function, and something inside of me said, you know, something's still missing. You know, but my answer was, I have to keep winning this award. So I work hard. You know, and this award comes in the mail, and I remember going to the mail around the time it comes, and I'm shaking. And I'm shaking because I have to win, you know, and I have to be the best. I have to be the best just to be average. Um, and, and that was what happened to me in that period of time. And, um, you know, but other things, but some good things did happen to me. I, you know, I continued to work the steps, and I continued to try to take actions that people were telling me to take. And I tried to repair some of the damage I had done in my family. And one of the things... I had done was that my grandfather, uh, you know, growing up, I was always told that my grandfather was abusive to my mother and, you know, that was not a good person. And I just somehow developed a resentment to my grandfather and, and just walk, and walled him out of my life. And I would go to conferences and I would hear speakers, you know, talk about how they needed to repair amends with their family members and how they did this over time. I, you know, I listened to Sharon B., how, you know, she wrote, you know, she had to pay off a debt to her father and she wrote these notes and, these cards, and over a period of time, that you know, that was what helped to heal the relationship, and and so I started doing these small things. I, my, I lived in Indiana. My father, my grandfather was in a nursing home in Hawaii, and I started sending him postcards. Um, I sent him subscriptions to National. Ge I knew he loved National Geographic, so his birthday, you know, I would send him subscriptions to National Geographic, and and then when I went home to visit my parents, you know, I would go visit my grandfather, and and my family would tell me, you know, you don't have to go see him. You don't have to go, and. You know, but I knew because of pe things that people had taught me, you know, that um, that I needed that I needed to be a loving, I needed to be a loving grandson. That I needed to do those things, and so I would go visit my grandfather. And people told me he wouldn't know who I was. And I walked in the door, and he said Samuel Alexander Van Horn, you know. And he was a very hard, you know, he was a Marine veteran. He had been in World War II, and um, you know, and come to find out, you know, the more I learned about him, the more I learned that he he might have grown up in an alcoholic home or in a abusive home, and I could see him, you know, that he was just a sick person, just like me, and, and all those things I'd been told growing up, that he was bad, that he was mean, 
that those things were wrong. And I learned how to enjoy being with him. And, um, you know, and when he died and I went back for the, when I went back for the funeral, we went back to my aunt's house where we had his effects. And, um, you know, and, and I found all of those postcards that I had sent him for those years. And, um, and when I saw those parts, postcards, I knew, I learned something about the value of action. Um, and the speaker last night talked about action, you know, that nothing changes if I don't do any action. Um, and often today, uh, as much as I don't like it, I have to change my actions in a situation and my sorry attitude uh, eventually follows me. <laughs> um, I wish I could say that I could just change my attitude in situations, but I have no, if I could just change my attitude in situations, I, you know, you'd probably have another speaker. I would just be out there changing my attitude. Um, but to this day, I need a sponsor. I need a home group. I need people that help me take the right actions, focus on my actions so that I live correctly and my attitude always, my attitude ends up following me. You know, I found those postcards and, you know, my father, my grandfather being a veteran, um, you know, he had a military funeral and but the fa my family gave me the, the flag that was presented to us. Um, and I keep that flag in my home and, and that's it. And, um, and that's nothing that I did. This is because of um, you, it's because of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's because of al -Anon family groups. It's because, of, it's because of sponsorship, and it's because of what you taught me in these rooms. And um, after, uh, after, you know, in Indiana, things obviously, you know, after I got, my, I got my degree there, my first sponsor was living in Iowa at the time, and he said, you should move out here. It's great out here. Uh, you'll like it out here. And so I packed up everything in a trailer. Uh, it didn't start out very well. I got rear-ended by a semi as I was moving here um, to, uh, to Iowa, but I got to, I got to Iowa and, and I, found a, I found a job, um, you know, teaching part-time at a community college there. And I started going to meetings again and I got a new sponsor. And, and I, started to get, I started to get a bit more active, active and involved in, um, in Al-Anon again. And I got a home group. My home group is a Sunday night Al-Anon book study in Iowa City. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great meeting. We, we meet at Sunday night at 7 o'clock at Mercy Hospital. We read the Al-Anon literature, and we, we celebrate Al-Anon anniversaries every month, and we have a good time. And, um, you know, and I got that job, and, and, I, and I had a teaching job when I was a graduate student, and, 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 it, and, I, and I was a poor teacher. Um, I, I didn't know how to teach. And, but the thing about not knowing how to teach, that wasn't the problem. The problem was I could never ask for help with my teaching, and, and this just continued when I got my job in Iowa City, and, um, and I found myself being very active. You know, I was my home group secretary. I did flyers for my meeting. I would spend three hours getting the formatting of my flyers done perfectly, um, but, not, uh, but, not plan, but not plan my class for the next day. You know, and one day I let this slip to my sponsor. I just accidentally told my sponsor what I was doing, and, he, and my sponsor said, yeah, I know, about, I know that about you. He said, you like, to, you like to take the easy action. You like to do the easy thing. You know, and that hurt. And, you know, but it kind of sat back there. And, um, you know, and sure enough, and what, I found, what, I, what I didn't realize what I was doing was that I had two ways of treating people. If you were a newcomer and walked in the door, you know, I, was, I, I shook your hand. If you were a newcomer woman, I directed you to a woman in the meeting. If you were a man, I gave you my phone number. I would perhaps take your phone number. I would offer to be your temporary sponsor. You know, I treated, there was no one I treated better than a newcomer. And it's probably true to this day that there's nobody I treat better than a newcomer. But, I, but my students in my classroom, you know, I thought, well, you know, they, you know they're, they're mean. That one doesn't really like me. So, you know, and I, I'm suspicious of that one. And, you know, and they don't do what I want them to do. And before, I've got like 20 resentments going on. You know, and that really weighs you down after a while. And, um, you know, and, and, I, and my teaching evaluation started to get worse and worse. And, and then one day I'm walking out of class and, um, and I see three of my students in the dean's office. And, and they're there talking, and they are talking about me. And, uh, you know, and what I find out is that, is that when, I, when I start going to work, there's a way to walk to my office, that, the short way that goes by the dean's office, and that there's the long way that doesn't. Um, and I start taking the long way to, to get to my office. And, and to this day, you know, if I cross the street when I see you, that's definitely a sign that I owe you an amend. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, that was a sign for me that something needed to happen. And, and, I, and that day, I walked out, you know, I, I had to, I, there was a payphone. I walked to the payphone. I called my sponsor, and I just let it all out, you know, that, you know, that I, my job is going horribly, and I want to quit. 
Um, you know, and my sponsor told me something, and I, and maybe you've had these moments in your life. My sponsor told me something to do that was the exact opposite of what I wanted to do at that time. In fact, it was an idea that never came into my head. My sponsor said to me, I want you to walk into your dean's office, and I want you to tell him you know you have a problem and ask him what you can do to improve. And that was the moment for me where my life changed because essentially I had a choice. I could keep doing what I wanted to do, which was take the long way to my office and hope that no one noticed, or I could take the action my sponsor wanted to take. Uh, and I did that. I walked into my de I walked into the dean's office and I said, you know, I know something. I know that things aren't going well, and I want to improve. What should I do? You know, and the and the dean said to me, he said, you know, if you hadn't come to me, um, I probably wouldn't have. You know, I probably wouldn't be willing to work with you, but because you came to me, here's what I want you to do. And he gave me a list of things to try. And, and I talked to people in my meetings. And, um, <clears throat> and for a long time, I had been going on and on in meetings about how, you know, oh, I'm having a hard time at work. And it was all I talked about. And I remember uh, around that time, I was hosting a speaker at the Southeastern Iowa Roundup. Carolyn was her name. And, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm taking her out for ice cream. She's, sitting, she's having ice cream, and she says something. She says, you know, when I go on and on to more than two people about a problem, I'm looking for an audience, not a solution. And, and, what, and, what she's, and, and when she said that, I knew that that was exactly what I was doing about my job, was that I had turned a meeting from a place that should be a place where, you know, where, like Teresa said, you know, people identify. A meeting should be a place where a newcomer can identify and see the solution in Al-Anon. And I had turned the meeting into my personal audience for my drama of the week. Um, and what I needed to do was start was start taking actions and start talking about my and stop talking about my problem so much and and that's how Al Anon has been for me is that I have needed to leave to go hundreds of miles away to people I've never met before to hear things that are going to change my life um, and that and, and that has happened to me many times in the program and, and so I started doing what people suggested I started talking to other teachers what do you how do you how do you teach what do I learn you know I, People suggested, what a novel idea. Buy a book about teaching. You know, read it. <laughs> um, learn about teaching. Practice. Um, you know, and so for a long period of time, you know, I wanted to quit that job, and I wanted to, I could have easily walked away from that job, um, but I did what my sponsor wanted me to do. And to this day, that's helped me in good stead, because when my, today when my sponsor gives me ideas, I mean, if, if, if my recovery depends on ideas making sense to my diseased brain, then I'm dead <laughs> because essentially the problem with alcoholism for me is that good ideas and bad ideas both come to me sounding like common sense. But you can see my bad ideas from a mile away. And, and I need to tell you those ideas so you say, yeah, that's, well, do that. But that idea, that's a horrible idea. Why would you do that idea? Why would you do that? And to this day, you know, I, of, of, of and by myself, I cannot differentiate those good ideas and those bad ideas, which is why I need a sponsor. You know, and, and so over a period of a year, I keep and my teaching evaluations start getting better. Um, and I know that I know the person that works in the office who does the teaching evaluation scores. And and um, and I said to him, I said, you know, how how am I doing? And he said, he said, well, you know, you're off the you know what list now. Um, <clears throat> you know, and when I and when it came time for me to leave that job, I could leave with my self esteem. You know, and I could leave not feeling like I had left behind. You know, wreckage. You know, I could. I just. I felt like a, like just part of the group. And and when I went back to school at Iowa for my doctorate, they actually asked me to stay and and continue to teach a couple courses for them um, uh, when I left. And 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 essentially, I, you know, I, I went to I went to back, back to graduate school, and I and I got my doctorate, and um, and that has helped. And while I was in graduate school, I studied. You know, I studied education, and, and, and today I have a job um, at the University of Iowa doing things I was trained to do. It's a job that I love, and, and it's, um, it's only because of the al family groups, and it's only because of taking actions that I, that I essentially did not want to take. Um, <clears throat> and I got involved, in, I, you know, and I I'd said that I got involved in al service, and I loved being involved in Al-Anon service. When I was new in service, I was a group representative, and I, I did my announcements at my meeting, at your meeting, at everybody's meeting. Um, I, you know, I just, I loved being part of the fellowship. There was never an Al-Anon election that I didn't win. Um, you know, when it became time for district treasurer or something, I always stood, and I was always elected. And, 
and then um, I'm involved at the at the uh, Al-Anon area, and it's time to stand for area elections, and, and I do that, and I stand for every position <laughs> that I wasn't elected. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and in my mind, I had lost. And and one of the elections, um, you know, I'm over this resentment now, but uh, there, I even lost to someone who wasn't in the room. And, uh, and you know, and... I, and my and I went. I left that assembly as angry as I had been in a long time. And I called my sponsor, and you know, and my sponsor listened to me and said, you know, here's your problem: is that that's exactly what you know. You listen to what you're saying is that you said you lost, you know, and you just you just were not elected, you know. And what I realized was that I loved the service that was up here. I loved giving the reports at the big meetings. I loved being in front of everybody. I loved having all of my group representatives here. To show that I'd brought them all, and you know, unwittingly, I had just I had made service about my own ego, and 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 my sponsor gave me clear directions. He said, "Your job is to go back to your home group, is to have a job in your home group, is to help the men in your home group, and to do the work that you know, and to and to be active there." And that was what I did. I went back to my home group. I didn't take another uh, district commitment. I have one job in my home group meeting now, and. You know, my job was to show up early and to stay late, and um, and to and to make sure and to look for the new person, and and to be on time for meetings. You know, Dick Martin taught me when I was new in the program. He said, 10 minutes early is on time. Um, if it's your home group, it's 30 minutes early." And I have found that 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 has helped me in good stead. It's it's the you know it's 10 minute newcomers are on time for. Have you noticed that newcomers in Al-Anon are on time for Al-Anon meetings? Um, you know, a meeting starts at 8 o'clock. They show up at 7.50. Um, you know, I show up 10 minutes early for a meeting. I get to talk to that newcomer. I get to shake their hand. You know, I remember what it was like walking through that door. Well, the second door, really. Uh, when I went through the second door to that small, you know, and I had no idea what I would. And the only thing propelling me through that door was the pain and the fear of the, what my life had become. And I need to be at that. I don't know. I don't get to know, you know, when I stand by the door at my home group meeting greeting people, I don't get to know when the newcomer is going to come through the door or when it's going to be my friend. So I need to be there and I need to be ready so that that newcomer is welcome, so that they get a newcomer packet. They, you know, someone shakes their hand, asks them why they're here because, because people did that for me. Um, and I want to do that for other people. And, uh, you know, and, and sometimes just just great things happen. You know, a newcomer came to a meeting, our newcomers meeting one night, and she walked into the meeting a little bit late, and she said, you know, she apologized for being late because she couldn't get the breathalyzer on her boyfriend's car to start, for you know, and she said this as normal as if she'd just forgotten milk at the grocery store, <laughs> you know, and and because I'm there, because I'm on time, I get to you know, I I get to I get to experience those things and. Um, and so, you know, and that's what service has become for me. It's become, it's become doing those little things. It's looking around. It's, it's wiping up the tables. It's stacking up the chairs. It's turning on the lights. It's bringing in the literature. It's doing the things, you know, it's doing the things that, frankly, nobody sees that get done <laughs> and people don't get thanked for. And, um, and, and that's, that's the type of service that I, that I, that I try to do um, in my group and, and in my area today. And, um, and after you know, at, you know, being sponsored and, and, and living in Iowa for a while, and um, you know, I, I decided, you know, for me, I went back to church, and and, and I, you know, at church, uh, I met the woman who became my wife, and um, and I remember going to church for a few weeks, and I remember asking my sponsor if it was okay for me to ask this person out, um, you know, for on a date, and and of course, I waited to the day the sermon was about Bathsheba, um, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, I chased her down after um, after the service, and I asked her for coffee, and and we've been married for um, four years. <laughs> Sorry, she's not going to hear this tape there. Um, <laughs> um, you know, we've been married for four years today, and you know, and I never thought I was one of these people that you know, dating. You know, I came up, when I was new in Al-Anon, People told me. You, you, you don't get her into a relationship because people that were like, it's like they just got sucked up by aliens or something. You know, Barb would get into a relationship and then Barb would be gone. And they would say, yeah, Barb got into a relationship. And, and so, you know, I was new and I was, so my, my first 10 years in Al-Anon, were quite, I was very, I was quite monkish in my, in my first 10 years of Al-Anon because I was petrified of like getting into a relationship and then boom, 
I would be one of those that would just, you know, be sucked out of here or something. And, you know, and so beginning to date and, you know, dating, learning how to date in recovery is like growing up in public. Uh, you know, you, you know, you're dating people in the meetings and here and there and everybody gets to see and, <clears throat> you know, and each one is a learning experience. And for a while, you know, I have to say that the, the best progress I made was that my breakups were getting much better. Um, <laughs> You know, much much more amicable, and you know, much more much more principled than than, than they had been um, than they had been previously. And you know, but 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 learning how to, you know, but learning how to date was you know something that you know my sponsor taught me how to do. My sponsor taught me how to to be principled and and to um, you know and to do those things. And so you know, and, and so when when I when I dated my wife, you know, I, I thank God for sponsorship. You know, thank God. That my I can get help in this area, any area of my life, as long as I'm willing to ask for it. You know, and I'd love to say that you know I get married and everything gets you know happily ever after. But w when my wife and I met, and uh, right before we got engaged, sometime before we got engaged, her mother was diagnosed with glioblastoma and only had a few months to live. And um, and it, she made a you know if you know what that disease is, you know that it's it's very bad. And um, and you know, and I remember traveling with my wife to Texas, uh, my at that time, you know, my girlfriend to Texas, and um, you know, and my girlfriend crawled into her mother's lap because they realized that she wasn't going to live many more than a couple of months. And you know, and I had never felt pain or grief that much just watching that. And you know, and I, I ran out, and I did the only thing I knew how to do was I called you, you know, I called my sponsor, and he wasn't there. I called, you know, I called the next person. I I called my best friend in the program, and. And people just told me, you know, because I wanted, to, I wanted to know how to fix it. You know, I'm an Al-Anon deep down. <laughs> if I can fix something, I will do that. <laughs> um, you know, and there was just no way to fix this. There's nothing that can be said. And people taught me, people told me that, you know, all I could do was, was, you know, was to love them and to be of service. And if there was something that needed to be done, that I would do it. And that was what I spent those months doing up to um, my, my, uh, my wife's mother's death, was that if there needed to be an action taken, I did it, uh, and I didn't. I just did whatever I could to be of service to that family, and um, <clears throat> and and thank God for Al-Anon and Alcoholics Anonymous that that you know that I was taught to get out of myself enough to be able to look around me and see those things. I learned that here, you know. I learned about being an Al-Anon that if I saw a newcomer sitting by themselves, that I should bring them a cup of coffee, that I should help them feel welcome. Um, and it was people here that taught me to look outside of myself and to get out of myself and to be a part of what was going on here. And I found that I can take that into all areas of my life today. Um, <clears throat> you know, I did make amends. Um, I, I kind of, I just, you know, want to say briefly that, you know, when I was, when I was new in Al-Anon uh, and became enthusiastic, I started to retroactively judge my father's Sobriety. I don't know why I did that, but I just started to realize. Well, I wonder how many meetings my father goes to, um, you know, because I'm going to so many meetings. And I started to, you know, and I started to kind of try to find these things out. And I tried, you know, and I did, you know, I would. Um, I started to retroactively sort of, you know, judge and and I, you know, and stupidly, I, you know, and then one day I'm talking to my father, and he's talking about being in that treatment center in 1984 and. You know, it's 20 years past, and he said, you know, that the people in his treatment class, you know, there's maybe of those 30 people or so, there's maybe five or so that are sober. Um, many of them are dead. You know, and I remember that, and I have to remember that today, that whenever I, and the big book talks about this at length. It says that if we find, you know, if we see whatever types of vagaries in the alcoholic's behavior, to be grateful for sobriety. And I am so grateful for my, that for my father's sobriety because I know that sobriety this is it's a game of seconds and inches, you know, and that I go to meetings with people, some of my best friends in meetings, that their loved ones, they have loved ones that are lost. They don't know where they are, or they or they know where they are, but they're but they're drinking and who knows what's gonna happen to them. Um, and so, you know, I am so grateful for what um, Alcoholics Anonymous has done for my family. Um, if it weren't for Alcoholics Anonymous, I would never have found the Al Anon family groups. And so, you know, I just want to close by saying that if you're new, you know, grab a hold of this thing. Find someone who's active. Find someone who has that light in their eye and just stick with them because you never know what you're going to find, and I wish you the best.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.